All right, today we're going to have a lecture on marine ecology. Uh, initially, I'd planned for this to be like an island ecology lecture, but then we incorporated some things like marine mammals, and it really wasn't uh, island specific. So we're making a broader marine ecology. All right, a couple of memes. Uh, that top left one's going to need a little context for you. Uh, so it says, I'm not a toy. I am not a Christmas present. I am a 400-year commitment. And that's because that is a Greenland shark. Um, and they think they're somewhere between 300 and 500 years old. So by far the oldest vertebrate on the planet. Uh, and you can see this little thing sticking out of its eye there. Um, they, actually, they actually dated this by looking at the crystalline structures within the eye. And that's how they determined this age. Uh, so that's pretty wild, a 500-year-old vertebrate. So back when, like, Copernicus was around, like, making the uh, hypothesis that the sun was the center of the universe and not the earth, this fish, the Greenland shark, was swimming around. Then we have some of our well-known Disney princesses there. Very pretty possum. And then we keep rolling with these uh, Bower bird <laughs> memes here. So uh, there's some... Lyrics from, I think it was Eiffel 65. Back in high school, that was a hot song for me. So the broad categories today are going to be the reef fishes, followed by the marine mammals, and then we'll finish up with mangroves. Um, when we touch on these, we'll move into more specific um, objectives or outlines when we talk about these individually here. First up, we have the reef fishes. So fish associated with our marine reefs. As promised, here's that more specific outline within the reef fish categories. So we'll do an overview of fishes first, um, and then we'll move into the herbivorous fishes, including the parrot fishes, the damsel fishes, move into the cleaner fish, and specifically we'll talk about the gobies, and then those omnivorous fishes, so maybe they're eating plant matter and they're piscivorous, eating other fish, or they're planktivorous, eating plankton, but they're omnivores, they're eating both. Now the fishes are the most diverse group of vertebrates. So not only are the fishes containing the oldest vertebrate, the Greenland shark, like we looked at with that meme, but they're also the most diverse group. And this consists of about 28,000 species and of these, most are going to be bony fishes, most are going to be ray-finned, and they're going to be teleost. So what, what do those words mean? Well, let's take a look at this phylogenetic tree here, starting down at the bottom with the vertebrates. Now notice here, at our first division, we can go one of two ways. We have our jawed vertebrates, our nathostomes, or our jawless vertebrates, the cyclostomes, or agnatha. Okay? Now, there are still some cyclostomes, or agnatha, these jawless vertebrates today. They include things like the sea lampreys, right? So those sea lampreys just suck onto the side of a fish, and they don't have jaws like our jawed vertebrates, the nathostomes. Okay? So we'll head to the left here with our first division, the nathostomes. That's going to be the majority of our reef fish are going to have jaws. Now, our next division here, we can see um, we're dividing between the bony fish and the cartilaginous fish. Now cartilaginous fish, like you dissected that dogfish in lab, they have a cartilaginous skeleton versus our bony fish, which have ossified bone. Okay? So we're gonna go left, because we said the majority of species have ossified bone. So they're osteichthyes, not chondrichthyes. Now our next division is gonna split these fish by whether they are lobed finned fishes or ray finned fishes. So to the left here, we have the sarcoterygy, sarcoterygy, our lobed fin fishes, and to the right we have the actinoterygy, our ray fin fishes. And again, the majority of fish are ray fin. Think about all the fish we caught in the fike net or when you were uh, using the seine net. Remember, you could pop up their dorsal fins, and they all have those spines supporting the fin, and that's a lot more common. Okay. The sarcoterygi are very rare. Um, they include things like lungfish and that really ancient coelacanth. Okay? They have these fleshy, lobe, like club-like fins with a bone in them for support. Okay? So let's move along. We're going to go to the Okay. Now, 
of these, we have the teleosts. Okay, so what are teleost fishes? Well, let's take a look at that next. The majority of those ray fin fishes, the actinoterygii, they are teleost. So what does it mean to be teleost? Well, that means you have a movable premaxilla, and this allows them to protrude their jaw to do things like consume prey. So 96% of all the species that exist on Earth now that are still around, they're extant, not extinct, they are teleost fishes. And all of our reef fishes, besides shark, sharks and rays, are also teleost fishes. So they have that protrudable jaw. Uh, they include things like the oarfish, that one on the left here, or that ocean sunfish in the middle. What does it mean to have a jaw that can protrude? Well, let's take a look at this here. Uh, you can see this image on the left, the fish there, the premaxilla, that top bone. Let me get my uh, handy dandy laser pointer here, right? This extends away from the rostral end of the fish. And if we look over here, you can see that it creates like a vacuum, like a suction when that protrudes and allows them to consume the prey. So those teleos fishes have that capability and that anatomy. Now we can even further subdivide our teleost fishes. And they're going to include things like the, let me get my pen here again, the salmoniforms, so those are like our trout and our salmon, the atheriniform, uh, those would be like smelt, and we have the persiform. Okay? Persiform means perch-like, and the majority of those teleos fishes are persiforms or perch-like. So what does it mean to be perch-like? Well, they have dorsal and anal fins. So think about the fish we caught again in the fight net. They had that dorsal fin and that anal fin, and they have those spiny anterior fins here. Spines, right? You gotta watch that you don't stick your hand. And then they have soft rayed fins in the back. Those you can touch without getting spiked, right? They're soft rayed. So the majority of our fishes are these persiforms. Again, these persiforms are the fish that you are most familiar with, at least in the context of our lab this fall. Here's a nice picture of a persiform, a big bluegill. Where do we find reef fishes? Well, they're found in shallow areas because that's where reefs are found. So in water, we're talking about here less than 100 meters deep. And then they're found in the tropic or subtropical regions. So you can see here, uh, with our world map, our equator, and then we have defined here, we have the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, okay? Um, and those um, indicate the tropical region, and then a little further out, we have the subtropics here. So those are the subtropical regions. So for example, like the Bahamas are in the subtropical region, okay? And reef fishes in general are benthic or near benthic. So remember, benthos means the bottom. So if you're benthic, you're sitting on the bottom, like the deep water sculpin in Lake Superior we talked about earlier in the semester. And they're going to be, as reef fishes are, associated with reef or rock. So they're going to rely heavily on that structure. Reef fishes can be broken down into three general categories. So the first is going to be the butterfly fishes and angel fishes. Very beautiful. The surgeon fishes, or these are sometimes called tang. Um, if you've seen Finding Nemo, Dory is a blue tang. Uh, and then we have the third group, the damsel fishes, clown fishes. Uh, that's a wrasse there, that middle one. And the parrot fishes, probably my personal favorite. We'll move on now. That was our overview of fishes, and we're going to move into the herbivorous fishes, including my favorite, the parrot fishes, and then the damsel fishes. The herbivorous fish associated with the reef are the most abundant. These are going to be out there, as this picture shows, eating things like algae. Um, 
The most common are going to be our parrot fishes and those tang, the surgeon fishes. Those are, if we're going to look at an example throughout this class, we can talk about the Caribbean. Um, and they're going to be dominant there. So that's what you're out snorkeling on the reef. You see an herbivorous fish, most likely parrot fish or tang. Now these are really important because they're removing 90 to 100% of the daily algal growth. Okay, so if we look at these fishes or these reefs that are overfished, right? You're pulling out too many and you are capturing too many herbivorous fish. Those overfished reefs are going to be covered by algae because those fish aren't there to eat that algae every day. Okay, their herbivory we say is unmatched within terrestrial habitats. So while we can see this consumption of 90 to 100 percent daily algal growth, you wouldn't see consumption of 90 to 100 plant growth on land is what we're saying. Here. On the left, we have a picture of a reef where parrotfish and tang are present. We compare that to an overfished reef. So these fish are now gone. And then we get something like this. The reef is covered in algae because those fish are not there to consume it every day. And algae goes, grows really quickly um, on a reef. You know, you're very close to the surface. You have lots of that light available for growth. These herbivorous fish tend to be daytime feeders, uh, and they also tend to look similar in that they have a blunt snout, and then they have these different variety of tooth or jaw structures that allow them to either graze algae, which means scraping it off of the coral, or they browse, and that just means they kind of selectively swim along and take chunks out. They selectively tear or bite at the algae. Uh, you can see here on the bottom there's a a parrotfish that is grazing that reef. It's taking those, uh, that's beak if you want to call it that, and it's scraping the algae off of that coral. So to investigate this a little further, we're going to turn to the parrotfishes or the scaring fishes. Parrotfishes belong to the family, the Scaridae. Uh, so sometimes they're called just the scaring fishes. Uh, and they exemplify specializations in herbivory. We're going to see lots of different dentition types that allow them to consume um, algae or plant life in different ways. Here's a beautiful rainbow parrotfish. So the parrotfishes as a whole have evolved these distinct adaptations that allow them to access food differently, uh, really get into their niche, right? Um, among the most abundant group of fishes are these parrot fishes, especially if you're near the reef. As you can see, they're all going to have this characteristic parrot-like beak. And it's, it's not actually a beak, it's fused teeth that end up forming these four distinct dental plates. Right? So you can see if you look closely there, they're individual teeth, they fuse together to create those plates that create this beak-like structure. Okay? And they all are specialized herbivores, and we'll take a look at these individually next. The other thing I want to point out is these teeth grow continuously, um, and the material that's worn away by feeding, it's constantly being replaced. The most abundant pair of fish that you're going to see at the reef are going to be the scrapers. So they're going to have this dentition specialized for scraping algae off a coral. Uh, they tend to be the most threatened due to overfishing, um, but we can see here on the right, they characteristically have this wide gape okay, between, between the dental plates there, and they have this very weak bite that allows them to kind of scrape the algae away. And if we look real closely, you can see they have many very small individual teeth that are all cemented together or they exist individually. Uh, get my laser pen here. All right. So here we see individual teeth, many small ones. While on this upper image here, you can still see some individual teeth, but they are cemented together to create that beak for scraping. If you're snorkeling and you come across a piece of coral that looks like this, those are grazing scars from those grazing parrotfish. 
Um, so you can see it looks like parallel tracks, and that's from those dental plates or their beak. Next up we have the excavators. So their beaks are made just for doing that, excavating. So they have really robust, strong jaws, and then they have the most beak-like structure, um, right? It really looks like a parrot's beak or something. And that's because all those teeth are highly fused. They also tend to have this bright blue enamel that is either white or blue. So it's very beautiful. You can see on this fish here, white beak, blue beak. And what they're going to do with that beak is crack or gouge at the reef, right? Remember the uh, reef, the animal is laying down that calcium carbonate structure, and that's what these parrotfish, the excavators, are going to be gouging at with those beaks. The bite marks or grooves from these excavating parrotfishes are going to look a little bit different. We're not going to see those parallel parallel tracks like we did with the grazers, or the scrapers, rather. Um, but you're going to see these grooves that are up to three millimeters deep on the surface of that coral, or maybe some bare calcium carbonate structure. So they'll take these, uh, they'll excavate using that beak to just clear a bit away. And they're going to remain clear like that. You'll be able to see those for a few days. And this is these fish are really important because what that does is it opens new reef areas that allow for colonization of other organisms. So by clearing that algae away, it makes room for things like these uh, jellyfish polyps here, right? So they're not always free swimming. The larva has a polyp phase which deposits on that open coral where that algae had just been cleared. So it creates gaps for these new animals to colonize. Um, among the jellyfishes, we have other corals. Um, and you can see they can remove up to five kilograms of that calcium carbonate within a square meter per day. Right? So that's, that's a really strong role as an excavator. And they'll typically do this to the dead corals or weak, brittle substrate that exists. So they're kind of like recyclers. They're not always going after the healthy corals and excavating, but they are doing it to those dead ones. So it's important for recycling the reef. That leaves us with the browsers. And the browsers are named because they selectively browse their habitat. So they're going to selectively go out and kind of snip at macroalgae. It's kind of like seaweeds and seagrasses. Um, they do this in a manner that doesn't disturb the substrate, so they're not ripping these plants up by the roots. And you can see their dentition looks different from the others because they have individual uncemented teeth, right? They're not all fused together. And that allows them to effectively nip at that seagrass, for example. Let's see, I do have an image of a parrotfish, a browser, swimming along and doing just that. So this is in a meadow of seagrass. The clarity is not the best, but you can see how they're just swimming along and casually nipping at the tips of that seagrass. So these parrotfishes, they really do have roles that may not be um, explicitly obvious to us. And those are going to be creating new space, as we saw, on those calcium carbonate surfaces, allowing other things to grow in there. So they're not just dominated by algae, for example, which they're clearing away. They also are going to remove that old carbonate structure. So when reef has died, you have that calcium carbonate structure left behind, even though it's not actively alive. They're going to come along and recycle that. And in doing so, they produce sediments. Take a look at this video here. <laughs> So you can see this scuba diver here following these parrotfish. And you can see they're leaving, leaving these puffs of sediment. That is recycled calcium carbonate. These fish have been actively eating the reef, and now they're redepositing that sediment elsewhere. So they have this role in redistributing the sediments and nutrients within the system as well. It's a large role as recyclers. Hopefully you can hear me over that. Fancy new.
Continuing on with the herbivores, I'll now introduce you to the damsel fishes. Uh, damsel fishes are unique because they tend gardens. Um, you can see here they are more deep bodied, meaning. Uh, wow. Right? They have a deep body from the dorsal to ventral side. Okay? And then they typically have forked tails, shown here. If you remember your uh, dorsal fin or your caudal fin anatomy from lab. And they tend to resemble cichlid fishes. If any of you have ever kept aquariums, um, they have these deep bodies. It's kind of what they look like. And then they have a single nostril on each side of the head. You can kind of see that nostril there. There are over 350 species of damselfish. And they all tend to be pretty territorial. And again, that's because they're cultivating these gardens. Okay, those gardens tend to be algae. And mostly we're seeing that it's this uh, filamentous type algae. So it's really long, little uh, like projections there of the algae. Um, so they, because they're these cultivators and uh, keeping eye on these gardens that they maintain, they're mostly herbivorous. Uh, here is a video of a damselfish diligently guarding its garden. So this scuba diver has come by and cruelly dropped an urchin within this damselfish's garden. And this damselfish does not like that. It doesn't want anything in its garden messing with its turf algae. So it starts pushing it out of the way to keep that cultivated area clear. The damselfish exhibit two types of behavior. So some species are gonna be intensive cultivators. So when we say intensive, uh, this means that they're gonna have a small area with prompt exclusion. They're not gonna let anything get near its small little farmed area. And it's gonna be monoculture. So we're gonna have one species of algae or macroalgae within that area. Okay, so this means it's going to be low algal diversity within its farmed area, right? It's going to be monoculture, one species. Think of like a monoculture crop like corn, right? That's all that's growing there. So you can be intensive cultivators or you can be an active cultivator. They're going to have a much larger area of mixed species of algae and they're going to have what's called delayed exclusion. So another cut fish can periodically swim through without being bothered. If they stand there too long, the uh, fish will come along, the damselfish will come along and shoo it away. Um, and this will promote higher algal diversity, right? Because this is a mixed species algae area within its cultivated portion. So those intensive cultivators, we said they're gonna have a smaller, more monoculture area that they're cultivating. So one species. And that means they have to remove the other undesirable algal species that start growing within their garden. We also said they're highly defensive. They have aggressive defense for other fishers, uh, fishes that enter into their turf garden. They also tend to exhibit mutualism. So think back to our species interactions. And that is this fish here. For example, let's take this dusky damselfish. It's maintaining this red algal turf garden. So that red algal turf garden is providing food for that fish, while that fish is providing protection from other species that may come in and graze it. Each species has a net benefit with this mutualistic relationship. Compare that to our active cultivators. And we said they had a larger garden that promotes greater species richness. More types of algae are gonna grow within their farmed area. And we said they exhibit delayed aggression. A fish can swim through without a problem. Lingers there, it may be bothered by the damselfish. Okay, let's move on to the cleaner fishes. And here we're specifically going to talk about the gobies. Okay. Uh, specifically here, we have a shark nose goby. Beautiful little cleaner fish.
Gobies belong to the family Gobidae, and there are more than 2,000 species within that family. It, it is one of the largest families. Gobies typically are less than four inches in length, so they're fairly small, and they're going to be benthic, so they tend to sit on the bottom. They don't have a swim bladder that they need for uh, buoyancy because they're just sitting on the bottom. And they're going to have, some at least, are going to have fused pelvic fins. So, for example, if we look at this image here on the right, those are the pelvic fins that have actually fused together to form a suction-like disc that they can use to cling onto coral or rock. We are going to focus on the cleaner gobies that are appropriately named because they tend to clean other organisms. And what they'll do is they'll perch on high points on the reef. So this will be on top of a coral or on top of a sponge. And in some way, they're going to advertise their cleaning services. So maybe it's going to do a little dance that other fish recognize, or it's going to rock its body in some manner. And then um, the other fish will come by because it knows it's going to get a free cleaning service. So this is a mutualistic relationship. Let's take a look at this video here. This specifically is a neon goby that is going to clean a tank. So it's sitting up perched on the rock here. And this one doesn't look like it's doing any type of dance or rocking motion. But then it comes out and it starts cleaning these other fishes within the aquarium. So the cleaner fish feed mainly on blood-sucking isopods, um, and they'll also feed on the mucus of whatever fish they're servicing, right? So the larger fish is getting cleaned, and the cleaner goby is getting a meal. So another mutualistic relationship there on the reef. While those cleaner gobies may not be familiar to you, the round goby may be. Um, these are found in areas like up in the Duluth Harbor, and they are an invasive species. So the round goby is native to the freshwater region of the Europe, Europe's Black and Caspian Seas, and they got into our Great Lakes through the Laurentian Seaway from the east coast, through that river system, moving through all the locks and dams of the Great Lakes, and that's where they were brought into the Duluth harbor. So an invasive species, um, and I actually did some work with them in the harbor. We set traps every summer with rotting fish in them, and then we'd have to pull them on the hottest days, and then put little tags on all these fish so we could kind of track their movements over time. Okay. All right, so we've covered herbivores, cleaner fishes, and now we're going to move on to those omnivorous Fishes. We'll finish up with those. And we'll start with the beautiful butterfly fishes. You can see these are appropriately named the four eyed butterfish because you can see it has two actual eyes and then two false eyes on the backside. So four eyes. There are 114 currently known species of butterfly fishes. And they all tend to look pretty similar. They all have these disc or oval shaped bodies. So they're round, they're thin bodied. So remember from lab our terms, they're laterally compressed. Um, and they have these concave foreheads, all right? You can see that here, get my pen. So they're concave, not convex. They're smaller, they're less than six inches in late, uh, length, and they tend to be silver or white, and they have these barred eyes, meaning their pattern goes right through their eyes. It's barred. And they all are mostly inactive at night, so they rest at night. It's appropriately named banded butterfly fish. Butterfly fish are trophically diverse in that some are going to eat coral, some are going to be herbivorous and eat algae, some are going to eat plankton, so they're planktivores. So it's better to classify them by how they feed. And butterfly fish are what we call ram feeders. So they tend to nip at their prey while lunging forward 
and protruding that jaw. Let's take a look at an image here. And this is some hobbyist aquarium, not on an actual reef, but this gives us a better idea of how they feed. So there's your butterfly fish there, that banded, that one with the barred eye, right? The rounder one. And let's see here. So the butterfly fish are up here, the yellow and silver. You can see they have those barred eyes. And look at the small little lunging movements they are making to consume those uh, shrimp that they're putting in. Uh, here, this is just exhibiting those patterns. So again, we have lots of yellows, whites, and silver. They all have those rounded bodies. They're all thin, and they all have those concave kind of foreheads, if you want to think of it that way. Okay. There's many, many more than what's shown here, and they all look very, very similar. Okay, and the last omnivorous reef fish we're going to examine are the angel fishes. Here's the beautiful queen angelfish. These are similar to butterfly fishes in that they tend to have rounded bodies and they have the same habitat preferences, but they are larger. Most are around one foot and they tend to be more colorful as well. We'll see lots more colorful um, colors rather than just those silvers, whites, blacks, and yellows as we saw with the butterfly fishes. And they have rounder foreheads. Right? You can see that they're not as convex other than that top left. Um, and they have a spine. Let me get my, well, look at that lower left image. They have what's called a gill spine. So off that operculum, they have a noticeable spine. And you can see that more obviously, or better on some of the fishes than you can the other angel fishes, but they all have it. And here's just a small selection of the angel fishes, and you can see how much more colorful they are than the butterfly fishes. Okay. And for the one or two of you in here that aren't as enamored with fish as I am, we are going to cover marine mammals next. I think a good place to start would be to review what makes a mammal a mammal. So mammals are vertebrates that have these four things. The first being mammary glands. So they can produce milk to feed their young. They, they lactate. Um, the second would be fur or hair. Now you may be thinking, well, I've never seen hair on a whale, for example. Well, they do. And especially uh, if you notice or look closely when they're born. Top left here, we have a whale. And this looks like it's flipped on its back, so that would be like the rostral side or the lip, if you will. And you can see there are fine hairs there. Sometimes they are completely removed or gone by when they're older, but they are there when they're born. Uh, these vertebrates will have three middle ear bones, as we do, right? The malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And then they have a neocortex. So that neocortex is kind of like the decision-making and language part of the brain. We're now familiar with what makes a mammal a mammal, but what is a marine mammal? Oh, it's a mammal that relies on the ocean, the marine environment, to survive. It's an informal group, meaning that these aren't necessarily phy phylogenetically related, right? Um, they're an informal group. You could have things in there like whale and sea otter, for example but they are unified by that reliance on the marine environment. Uh, they can be either obligate water dwellers, so they have to stay in the water, or they're semi-aquatic, and we see that there are five recognized groups, which we'll talk about next. Here we have the phylogeny of marine mammals. Okay, so we have mammals over here, and we'll start with our different divisions here. Of our five groups, so the first up, we have Sirenia. Uh, that includes things like your dugongs and your manatees. We have cetacea, 
consists of our whales and dolphins. Ursidae. Might not have seen this one coming, but that is the polar bear. Marine mammal because they rely heavily on marine systems. Mustelidae. Um, mustelids include your weasels, right? So these will be things like our sea otter, sea mink, marine otter, and then the pinnipeds. And these would be the seals, walruses, and sea lions. And we're going to start with that last one, the pinnipeds, pinnipedia. So pinnipeds are seals. Uh, Latin here, a little bit of Latin for you. Pinna means fin, pedis means foot. So fin foot, flipper footed. These would be semi-aquatic. They can leave the water without any issue. There are 34 species that exist today, and they all descend from one central line. They belong to the order carnivora. Others within that order would be bears and weasels. There are three families of the pinnipeds. The first is the, this is a fun one to say, Odobodenidae, uh, like the walrus. Okay. Otis in Greek means teeth. And you can see those large tusks there, earning that name Obodenidae, okay. giant teeth. Uh, next we have the Oteridae, or the eared seals. So this consists of our sea lions and fur seals. And that's because they have those ears there that you can see. That Latin name comes from um, ota, which means ear, because those ear seals and sea lions have that visible external ear. Contrast that to phocidae, the earless seals. And we call these the true seals. Can you see there how there is not an external ear? Collectively, seals have a massive range. You can find them along most coasts and cold waters, um, but the majority of them probably live with, in the Arctic or Antarctic waters. Um, just to show you how extensive this range is, I want to show you one example here. So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lake Baikal. It's the largest freshwater lake, I should say the deepest freshwater lake in the world. Uh, it's found within Russia. And on the image there on the right, you can see our Great Lakes um, and Lake Superior and how that stacks up against the depth with Lake Baikal. Well, there's actually a endemic seal native to Lake Baikal. So that means endemic meaning it's only found there in the world. Okay? And it's called the Baikal seal. All right, next we have the sea otters. And sea otters belong to the family Mustelidae. So they're Mustelids, like the other weasels. That's the weasel family. And they are the smallest of the marine mammals. And they too are semi-aquatic. So they don't need to be in the water all the time. They can leave the water without issue. Um, they're native to the Pacific Ocean, and specifically the colder waters. On the right there, you can see their original range in blue, and then their current range in that yellowish orange. Um, that range change is due to a couple things. One was extensive overhunting, and then there's been some water temperature changes as well. One of the amazing things about sea otters is their dense coat. They have the densest coat in the animal kingdom, and it has about 1 million hairs per square inch. Uh, if that doesn't blow your mind to give you some uh, perspective, your dog has about 60,000 hairs per square inch. And they're arranged in a kind of layered pattern. You have these outer guard hairs, and they're going to act to smooth and waterproof that coat. And their main goal is to protect those under hairs from getting wet. Those under hairs trap an insulating layer next to the skin, because remember, these guys occupy really cold waters. Now that coat has also gotten them in a little bit of trouble historically. Their numbers were once estimated to be around 300,000, and they were hunted extensively for their fur in the 18th century and 19th century. And the population of these seattles fell to around 1,000 individuals, and they were living in a fraction of their historic range. So they've rebounded a little bit now, but um, they're still not back to what their normal range was, as you saw in that previous slide. All right, now 
for the one that seemingly comes out of left field, the polar bear, and appropriately named Ursus maritimus. Maritimus just means associated with the sea. So they belong to the family Ursidae, as the other bears do, and they are semi-aquatic. Um, but they're within this marine mammal category because they depend on the ocean for the majority of their food. And you may not realize it, but they're also amazing swimmers. They regular swim distances of over 30 miles. Okay? So they're found within the Arctic Circle. You can see there the top of the globe from top down, the image on the right. And they are the largest existing lar uh, land carnivore. So I remember one of these is stuffed at the Science Museum of Minnesota and just towers over you. They're around 1,500 pounds. And their diet consists predominantly of seals, so that's why they're dependent on the ocean for their food. Continuing on with our cool facts about marine mammals, uh, polar bear hair is actually hollow. Some of you may know that. And it's not technically white. It is actually clear. Okay. Now, the reason that it's hollow is some people say it adds extra warmth, and maybe it adds a little extra warmth having that hollow center traps heat. But the real reason is it kind of acts like a fiber optic cable. So it catches that sunlight. It scatters the light within that hair and concentrates it at the base of the hair follicle. So it's like a light trapping tube. And then the polar bear skin is actually black. So that black pigmentation helps absorb that light from that hollow follicle. And it keeps the bear warm. Next up we have my personal favorite, the Sirenians. They belong to the Order Sirenia. Um, if you've ever heard the siren song, right? How the, the siren or the mermaid used to sit on the rocks and sing the song. Well, they originally thought these guys were uh, mermaids when sailors saw them. So it's kind of a twisted take on folklore, I suppose. But they're otherwise known as the sea cows. And these are obligate water dwellers. So they're not going to be leaving the water. Um, and they are herbivorous, and there are two families that consist of four species. The Sirenia, they all inhabit warm, shallow waters. These could be coastal waters or inland uh, channels or rivers. Uh, on the left, we have the Dugong, okay? And they are native to Indo-West Pacific. So when I was in Australia, for example, we saw a dugong in one of the little mangrove channels. And that's where you find them there. They consume seagrass and they're found in different bays and those channels. And what really makes them different from the manatee is they have this dolphin-like tail. And you can see that there. If you cover up the first half, it may look like a small whale or a dolphin. Now contrast that to the manatee. There are three species of manatee um, that exist currently. And they're found within the marshy, co marshy coastal areas and rivers of the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, the Amazon, and West Africa. Now take a look at that tail compared to the dugong. It is a rounded tail. And their facial appearance is also different as well, not to mention the habitat difference. Um, there used to be another type uh, called a sea cow, Stellar sea cow, which was hunted to extinction in the early 18th century. All right, and finally, that brings us to cetacea, the cetaceans, the whales, dolphins, and porpoises. These, of course, are obligate water dwellers, um, and they have two front flippers. You can see that on the left image, and then two flukes, right? So the tail consists of two flukes, a right fluke, and a left fluke. Um, and for the cetaceans, we classify them by whether they are toothed, or whether they have a baleen and filter out smaller organisms from the water. The toothed whales are the odontocetes, right? And dont meaning tooth. And they have conical teeth to catch their prey that consists generally of fish and squid. So you can see those conical teeth there on the right. And you're familiar with toothed whales because that is our dolphins, our porpoises as well as those sperm whales that eat the giant squid, the orcas or killer whales, and then the beluga whale. And let's talk about one of the odontocetes here. We'll take a deeper dive, good pun. We'll talk about the sperm whale. 
And this is the largest of those odontocetes, or the toothed whales. And they can dive up to 2,250 meters deep. And they do this to go after their prey, the giant squid. So these dives can, dives can last over one hour. This is an air-breathing mammal, so that's pretty wild. And as I said, their diet consists of giant squid. Um, because they have some commercially important, or were, products such as sperm oil, ambergris, and teeth, they became a whaling target. So let's take a look at these uh, goods they provide here. Okay, here are some of the products they used to harvest from these sperm whales. On the top left, you have ambergris. Now, ambergris is pretty goofy. It's this waxy, smelly substance that forms in the intestines of these sperm whales. And then you'll find it floating on the surface or on the beach. Um, it's actually very, very valuable. And it used to be used in uh, fragrances, so like colognes and perfumes. It's no longer used, but it had high commercial value. On the bottom there, um, that's an example of scrimshaw on the surface of a sperm whale tooth. So it was used for art. Um, and then on the right, we have sperm oil. This was used for like Burning lamps, for example, they would render the fat and then you'd be left with this concentrated oil. Another odontocete we'll be looking at are the dolphins. So dolphins are toothed whales. They have a large range in size, anywhere from 5 feet, so pretty small, to over 31 feet, very large. The dolphins all have very streamlined bodies and they have these conical teeth like you can see there on the bottom right. Dolphins do prefer warmer, warmer climates, and you're familiar with their system or communication of these clicks and whistles. One of the more popular and common dolphins in the area would be the bottlenose dolphin. You can see its expansive range within that top, top image there. Um, and as we know, they are highly intelligent. They've done intelligence studies, and they show that dolphins know how to use tools, and they can also transmit knowledge between each other, so they teach each other. The last tooth whale I'm going to mention is the killer whale or orca, which are the largest of the tooth whales, up to about 31 feet in length. They have a very diverse diet. Um, some will eat other mammals like seals and sea lions, and others will eat fish. And generally those populations tend to stick to one of those prey items or the other. So there's kind of some that eat fish, some that eat mammals, there are some that eat both. Um, if you're down in the Bahamas, for example, you can see pods sometimes in the late spring as they are moving through following the tuna. And the last of our cetaceans here, we have the mysticetes, which are the baleen whales. So they have a baleen, they aren't toothed. And the baleen is a structure that's made up of keratin, like your fingernails. And it creates these plates in the mouth that act as a sieve, right, to filter out plankton. So it's kind of interesting, the largest organism on Earth, well, at least animal, is feeding itself by the one of the smallest things on Earth, plankton. Um, there are 16 species of baleen whales, and they range from 20 feet to 102 feet in length. They all have fused neck vertebrae, so they're unable to turn their head, and they have two blowholes, and they tend to prefer colder waters. And the largest of these mysticetes or baleen whales is the blue whale. And in fact, it's the largest animal to live on Earth and ever live on Earth, considering all the dinosaurs as well. And you can see it there um, compared to the orca for some size comparison. All right, let's start talking about mangroves then. Uh, here you can see that collection of tangled roots that is uh, pretty characteristic of mangroves. And we'll talk about why they have that appearance Coming up. Well, first off, we need to talk about what a mangrove is. Okay, so you may hear these referred to as mangrove swamps due to the kind of uh, swampy intertidal zones that they occupy with silty soils. Um, and what we're talking about here is a collection of salt tolerant evergreens. Now, when we talk about evergreens here in Minnesota, you're probably thinking about the coniferous trees like the pines and the spruces. Um, but these indeed are evergreen trees because where they grow in the tropics and subtropics, their leaves are always green. Um, they don't fall off or brown. 
uh, unless Leaf is dead, of course. And instead of talking about one specific species of tree here, like a mangrove tree, it's a collection of various uh, species, 80 in fact, from 16 different families. So it's really broad. Okay? Now what all these mangroves share, or ca common characteristics, would be that they are tolerant of low oxygen soils. Uh, they're found in slower waters that have high degrees of sediment deposition. And they all have these characteristic prop roots that kind of hold them up due to the um, intertidal zone or being you know, flooded with high tide and then that water retreating during low tide. Okay. Now, often, though there are 80 different species, we don't see them all together. It's usually only about three to four different species of mangrove tree that make up a mangrove uh, swamp, if you want to call it that. Okay. And mangrove trees as a group are pretty resilient um, compared to a lot of other trees we would think of. They are tolerant of broad ranges in salinity, temperature. You can imagine with waves retreating with tides, they're exposed to high temperature just baking in the sun and then that water comes back. Moisture with those intertidal changes and then waves, um, there's, you know, they're on the coastal areas, so they're constantly taking abrasion by waves. Mangroves then are a group of trees and shrubs that we find in coastal intertidal zones. So coastal, looking at this map here, we can see they're found all over the world in different coastal regions, but they are defined to the tropical and subtropical zones. So when we're in the Bahamas here, remember that is a subtropical zone. Okay? Um, they can be found not only in coastal saltwater, but they can be found in brackish water as well, which is a mixture of fresh and saltwater. So there's some that are at the entry to riverways, for example. And mangroves play a pretty important ecological role, and they do that in a couple different ways. So the first is that they slow the movement of tidal waters. You can imagine in the coastal areas where these trees establish, there's tidal changes and there's wave impact. So they just help act as a buffer to the shore. Uh, they also provide cover for fish. They do that with the roots. They also do that by slowing the waves. They also provide uh, cover for other organisms we'll talk about shortly. With the waves and tidal changes, they also carry with them sediments, and the mangroves help those sediments settle out. And oftentimes they'll be carrying some pretty harmful stuff, like different heavy metals. So then they're kind of lost and buried within that anoxic soil uh, in which they're growing it. And the last thing they do is they help stabilize the coastline. So they help reduce erosion from the currents we talked about, uh, wave action, and then storms when they do impact. So not only are mangroves important for the small animals that occupy them, but they're important for different coastal communities and towns uh, around the world. So a study here looked at the impacts of wave action, actually specifically hurricane action, after mangroves were removed for scenic views for tourist development. Well, they found that pretty quickly, um, every few years, you know, their areas would be destroyed and flooded without the mangrove presence, which helps really break up that wave action. The specific protection that mangroves offer for fish and other small species makes them excellent nurseries. So when we say nursery, um, this is where juveniles can develop. So there's many things happening with a mangrove. You have the cover provided from roots. You have the protection from that abrasive wave action. There also tends to be abundant food, and their predators, um, those roots are so tight, the larger predators can't get in there to uh, predate them. Okay. So they're a nursery for coastal and offshore fishes. So not just fishes that are associated with the coast, offshore fishes will come and use those as a nursery to develop, and then they'll move offshore once they're a little bigger. And importantly, some shellfish, such as oysters, they exclusively breed or spawn within mangroves. So not only are mangroves important for juvenile fishes and mollusks, they're important for birds as well as they offer nesting sites or rookeries. So many species of birds rely on these mangroves for protection during nesting. 
Um, these pictures here were taken, I actually took them down in Florida. We were down doing a little mangrove tour with kayaks there on the Gulf side. You can see on the branch in front of the kayak, there's an anhinga. That's a diving species of bird. And then on the right, there's a little blue heron uh, sitting on those prop or stilt roots. Mangroves also serve as what we call a heavy metal sink. And that is more harmful heavy metals such as lead are lost here in the sediments and they're buried in that anoxic soil over time. And they've actually found that when they go in and remove these mangroves for shoreline development, for tourism for example, those heavy metals are then exposed to the water column again and it contaminates the local seawater and organisms within that area. Now that we know why mangroves are important ecologically, I want to shift a little bit back to the trees themselves and talk about what makes them different from other trees. Okay, so I keep mentioning these stilt roots or prop roots, characteristic of the mangrove, but what are they? Well, as the name kind of indicates, they uh, add additional support to the tree. We're thinking here, we're growing in these like silty, high sediment soils, and then there's wave action and tidal changes. These trees need some support, so these act as stilts to stabilize them. Right? So the prop roots, or the stilt roots, they come out from stems or branches and then penetrate downward to stabilize the tree. Okay? And then another action of these roots is atop the branches, there are pores that allow for gas exchange. And the tops of these roots usually stay below the water or I should say above the water with intertidal changes. Here's a good look at those stilt roots within the top picture. I know we can kind of see what I'm talking about here. If we have the trunk of the tree and then the soil below it, and then we would have water come in here with high tide, the tops of these prop roots or stilt roots, they stay above the water and they have tiny pores on their surface that allow for the gas exchange that is necessary for photosynthesis. Not all mangrove trees use prop or stilt roots. Okay? Others are gonna use what we call pneumatophores, or in this case, um, I think they're commonly called pencil roots because, well, kind of look like pencils sticking up out of the silt there. So we can see in the background there's this tree here, and we notice there are not stilt roots, but notice all these little pencil-like projections sticking up out of the sediment. Okay. These are pneumatophores, and they're gonna deliver oxygen to the roots beneath the surface. That prefix pneuma means breathing. Okay. So the underground tissue of any plant requires oxygen for respiration, and in the mangrove environment, oxygen is very limited. Again, that's due to that anoxic soil. Okay. So this means that the mangrove root system has to take up oxygen from the atmosphere, and that's what these little pencil roots or pneumatophores do. They project up, and they typically stay above the waterline and provide gas exchange. Something pretty cool about mangrove trees is that they show vivipary or they are viviparous. So what does that mean? Well, vivipary in flowering plants just means there's continuous growth of the offspring while it's still attached to the parent tree. Okay, so think about this. Although a mangrove is you know, like a great place for juvenile fish to develop, it's actually not a great place for another mangrove tree to establish. Once those mangroves uh, kind of establish that coastal area, they create those anoxic silty soils. And it's high saline as well. And that's not a great environment for seeds to germinate and establish. Okay. So what happens is the seeds germinate and develop into little clones, basically, of the parents while they're still attached to the parent tree. And we call these propagules. So then these little flowering plants or offspring, they drop from the tree. We call them a propagule. And then these are buoyant. And they float with tidal changes to some other coastal area where the conditions are better. And they find suitable soil to root. All right, so that's it for mangroves. I hope I have impressed upon you the importance, ecological importance of mangrove forests. Uh, I'm excited to check it out when we're down there. I've only been once and that was down off Sanibel in Florida. 
So that's this picture here, my wife and I on that kayak. Saw some birds, saw some pretty cool fish, and I'm excited to do it again. So with that, I will take any questions.